Ed. Translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Sutta-central.net and suttas.com. Part 3 The Book of Aggregates, Kandhaviga. Chapter 1 Kanda Samayuta, On the Aggregates. 060, SN.22.34 SN.22.52. SN.22.34 Dudiyanatum Hakasutta, not yours, 2. This sutta is identical with the preceding one except that it omits the simile. SN.22.35 Anatara Bhikkhu Sutta, a certain Bhikkhu, 1. At Zavathya. Then a certain Bhikkhu approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said to him, Venerable Sir, it would be good if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma in brief, so that, having heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One, I might dwell alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute. Bhikkhu, if one has an underlying tendency towards something, then one is reckoned in terms of it. If one does not have an underlying tendency towards something, then one is not reckoned in terms of it. Understood, blessed one. Understood, fortunate one. In what way, Bhikkhu, do you understand in detail the meaning of what was stated by me in brief? If, venerable sir, one has an underlying tendency towards form, then one is reckoned in terms of it. If one has an underlying tendency towards feeling, then one is reckoned in terms of it. If one has an underlying tendency towards perception, then one is reckoned in terms of it. If one has an underlying tendency towards volitional formations, then one is reckoned in terms of them. If one has an underlying tendency towards consciousness, then one is reckoned in terms of it. If, venerable sir, one does not have an underlying tendency towards form, then one is not reckoned in terms of it. If one does not have an underlying tendency towards feeling, towards perception, towards volitional formations, towards consciousness, then one is not reckoned in terms of it. It is in such a way, venerable sir, that I understand in detail the meaning of what was stated by the Blessed One in brief. Good, good, Bhikkhu. It is good that you understand in detail the meaning of what was stated by me in brief. If, Bhikkhu, one has an underlying tendency towards form, as above in full, then one is not reckoned in terms of it. It is in such a way that the meaning of what was stated by me in brief should be understood in detail. Then that Bhikkhu, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's statement, rose from his seat, and, after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he departed. Then, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute, that Bhikkhu, by realizing it for himself with direct knowledge, in this very life entered and dwelt in that unsurpassed goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the household life into homelessness. He directly knew, destroyed his birth, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more for this state of being. And that Bhikkhu became one of the Arahants. The Buddha teaches a monk who wants to go on retreat that one is reckoned by what one has an underlying tendency for. The monk gives a full explanation. SN.2236 Tudiyanatara Bhikkhu Sutta, a certain Bhikkhu, 2. At Zavathya. Then a certain Bhikkhu approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said to him, Venerable Sir, it would be good if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma in brief, so that, having heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One, I might dwell alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute. Bhikkhu, if one has an underlying tendency towards something, then one is measured in accordance with it, if one is measured in accordance with something, then one is reckoned. In terms of it, if one does not have an underlying tendency towards something, then one is not measured in accordance with it, if one is not measured in accordance with something, then one is not reckoned in terms of it. Understood. Blessed one. Understood, fortunate one. In what way, Bhikkhu, do you understand in detail the meaning of what was stated by me in brief? 
If, venerable sir, one has an underlying tendency towards form, then one is measured in accordance with it, if one is measured in accordance with it, then one is reckoned in terms of it. If one has an underlying tendency towards feeling, towards perception towards volitional formations, towards consciousness, then one is measured in accordance with it, if one is measured in accordance with it, then one is reckoned in terms of it. If, venerable sir, one does not have an underlying tendency towards form, then one is not measured in accordance with it, if one is not measured in accordance with it, then one is not reckoned in terms of it. If one does not have an underlying tendency towards feeling, towards perception, towards volitional formations, towards consciousness, then one is not measured in accordance with it, if one is not measured in accordance with it, then one is not reckoned in terms of it. It is in such a way, venerable sir, that I understand in detail the meaning of what was stated by the Blessed One in brief. Good, good, Bhikkhu. It is good that you understand in detail the meaning of what was stated by me in brief. If, Bhikkhu, one has an underlying tendency towards form, as above in full, then one is not reckoned in terms of it. It is in such a way that the meaning of what was stated by me in brief should be understood in detail. Then that Bhikkhu, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, rose from his seat, comma, and that Bhikkhu became one of the Arahants. The Buddha teaches a monk who wants to go on retreat that one is measured by what one has an underlying tendency for. The monk gives a full explanation. SN.22.37 Ananda Sutta, Ananda, 1. At Savathya. Then the Venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One. The Blessed One then said to the Venerable Ananda as he was sitting to one side, If, Ananda, they were to ask. You, friend Ananda, what are the things of which an arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned, being? Ask thus, how would you answer? Venerable Sir, if they were to ask me this, I would answer thus, friends, with form an arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned. With feeling, perception, comma, volitional formations, comma, consciousness and arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned. These, friends, are the things of which an arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned. Being asked thus, Venerable Sir, I would answer in such a way. Good, good, Ananda. With form, Ananda, an arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned. With feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness and arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned. These, Ananda, are the things of which an arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned. An alteration of that which stands is discerned. Being asked thus, Ananda, you should answer in such a way. The Buddha speaks to Ananda on what Eden. 3.47 described as the characteristics of conditioned phenomena, arising, ceasing, and change while persisting. This was to become a critical aspect of later theories on the nature of change. Ananda explains in terms of the aggregates. SN.22.38 Tuti Yananda Sutta, Ananda, 2. At Savathya. The Blessed One then said to the Venerable Ananda as he was sitting to one side, If, Ananda, they were to ask you, Friend Ananda, what are the things of which an arising was discerned, a vanishing was discerned, an alteration of that which stands was discerned? What are the things of which an arising will be discerned, a vanishing will be discerned, an alteration of that which stands will be discerned? What are the things of which an arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned? Being asked thus, Ananda, how would you answer? Venerable Sir, if they were to ask me this, I would answer thus, friends, with form that has passed, ceased, changed, 
an arising was discerned, a vanishing was discerned, an alteration of that which stands was discerned. With feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness that has passed, ceased, changed, an arising was discerned, a vanishing was discerned, an alteration of that which stands was discerned. It is of these things, friends, that an arising was discerned, that a vanishing was discerned, that an alteration of that which stands was discerned. Friends, with form that has not been born, not become manifest, an arising will be discerned, a vanishing will be discerned, an alteration of that which stands will be discerned. With feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness that has not been born, not become manifest, an arising will be discerned, a vanishing will be discerned, an alteration of that which stands will be discerned. It is of these things, friends, that an arising will be discerned, that a vanishing will be discerned, that an alteration of that which stands will be discerned. Friends, with form that has been born, that has become manifest, an arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned. With feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness that has been born, that has become manifest, an arising is discerned, a vanishing is discerned, an alteration of that which stands is discerned. It is of these things, friends, that an arising is discerned, that a vanishing is discerned, that an alteration of that which stands is discerned. Being asked thus, Venerable Sir, I would answer in such a way. Good, good, Ananda. The Buddha here repeats the entire answer of the Venerable Ananda, concluding. Being asked thus, Ananda, you should answer in such a way. The Buddha speaks to Ananda on what Eden. 3.47 described as the characteristics of conditioned phenomena, arising, ceasing, and change while persisting, as applied to past, future, and present. Ananda explains in terms of the aggregates. SN.22.39 Anadama Sutta, in accordance with the Dhamma, 1. At Savathya. Bhikkhus, when a bhikkhu is practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, this is what accords with the Dhamma, he should dwell engrossed in revulsion towards form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. One who dwells engrossed in revulsion towards form, and consciousness, fully understands form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. One who fully understands form, and consciousness is freed from form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. He is freed from birth, aging, and death, freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair, freed from suffering, I say. To practice in line with the teachings a mendicant should meditate on disillusionment with the aggregates. SN.22.40 Dutti Yanadama Sutta, in accordance with the Dhamma, 2. At Savathya. Bhikkhus, when a bhikkhu is practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, this is what accords with the Dhamma, he should dwell contemplating impermanence in form. As above, he is freed from suffering, I say. To practice in line with the teachings a mendicant should meditate on the aggregates as impermanent. SN.22.41 Tathayanadama Sutta, in accordance with the Dhamma, 3. He should dwell contemplating suffering in form. As above, he is freed from suffering, I say. To practice in line with the teachings a monk should meditate on the aggregates as suffering. SN.22.42 Ketutthanadama Sutta, in accordance with the Dhamma, 4. He should dwell contemplating non self in form. As above, he is freed from suffering, I say. To practice in line with the teachings a mendicant should meditate on the aggregates as not self. SN.22.43 Atatapasutta, with yourselves as an island. At Savathya. Bhikkhus, dwell with yourselves as an island, with yourselves as a refuge, with no other refuge, with the Dhamma as an island, with the Dhamma as a refuge, with no other refuge. 
when you dwell with yourselves as an island, with yourselves as a refuge, with no other refuge, with the Dhamma as an island, with the Dhamma as a refuge, with no other refuge, the basis itself should be investigated thus, from what are sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair born? How are they produced? And, bhikkhus, from what are sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair born? How are they produced? Here, bhikkhus, the uninstructed worldling, who is not a seer of the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who is not a seer of superior persons and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, regards form as self, or self as possessing form, or form as in self, or self as in form. That form of his changes and alters. With the change and alteration of form, there arise in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, volitional formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessing consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That consciousness of his changes and alters. With the change and alteration of consciousness, there arise in him sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. But, because, when one has understood the impermanence of form, its change, fading away, and cessation, and when one sees as it really is with correct wisdom thus, in the past and also now all form is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, then sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair are abandoned. With their abandonment, one does not become agitated. Being unagitated, one dwells happily. A bhikkhu who dwells happily is said to be quenched in that respect. When one has understood the impermanence of feeling, of perception, of volitional formations, of consciousness, its change, fading away, and cessation, and when one sees as it really is with correct wisdom thus, in the past and also now all consciousness is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, then sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair are abandoned. With their abandonment, one does not become agitated. Being unagitated, one dwells happily. A bhikkhu who dwells happily is said to be quenched in that respect. Dwell with yourself as an island and refuge, with the Dhamma as an island and refuge. How? by investigating how suffering arises from identification with the aggregates. SN.22.44 Patipadasutta, The Way At Savathya Bhikkhus, I will teach you the way leading to the origination of identity and the way leading to the cessation of identity. Listen to that, and what, Bhikkhus, is the way leading to the origination of identity? Here, Bhikkhus, the uninstructed worldling, regards form as self, feeling as self, perception as self, volitional formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as in consciousness. This, bhikkhus, is called the way leading to the origination of identity. When it is said, the way leading to the origination of identity, the meaning here is this, a way of regarding things that leads to the origination of suffering. And what, bhikkhus, is the way leading to the cessation of identity. Here, Bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple, does not regard form as self, nor feeling as self, nor perception as self, nor volitional formations as self, nor consciousness as self, nor self as in consciousness. This, Bhikkhus, is called the way leading to the cessation of identity. When it is said, the way leading to the cessation of identity, the meaning here is this, a way of regarding things that leads to the cessation of suffering. Contemplation of the five aggregates as not self is the path to the end of identity. SN.22.45 Anaxasutta, Impermanent, 1. At Savathya. Bhikkhus, form is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, 
this is not myself. When one sees this thus as it really is with correct wisdom, the mind becomes dispassionate and is liberated from the taints by non-clinging. Feeling is impermanent. Perception is impermanent. Volitional formations are impermanent. Consciousness is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees this thus as it really is with correct wisdom, the mind becomes dispassionate and is liberated from the taints by non-clinging. If, bhikkhus, a bhikkhu's mind has become dispassionate towards the form element, it is liberated from the taints by non-clinging. If his mind has become dispassionate towards the feeling element, towards the perception element, towards the volitional formations element, towards the consciousness element, it is liberated from the taints by non-clinging. By being liberated, it is steady, by being steady, it is content, by being content, he is not agitated. Being unagitated, he personally attains Nibbana. He understands, destroyed is birth, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more for this state of being. Seeing the five aggregates as impermanent, etc., leads to freedom. SN.22.46 Dudiyanaksasutta, impermanent, 2. Atsavathya. Bhikkhus, form is impermanent. Feeling is impermanent. Perception is impermanent. Volitional formations are impermanent. Consciousness is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees this thus as it really is with correct wisdom, one holds no more views concerning the past. When one holds no more views concerning the past, one holds no more views concerning the future. When one holds no more views concerning the future, one has no more obstinate grasping. When one has no more obstinate grasping, the mind becomes dispassionate towards form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, and is liberated from the taints by non-clinging. By being liberated, it is steady, by being steady, it is content, by being content, one is not agitated. Being unagitated, one personally attains Nibbana. One understands, destroyed is birth, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more for the state of being. Seeing the five aggregates as impermanent, etc., leads to letting go of views and ultimately to freedom. SN.22.47 Samanupasana Sutta, Ways of Regarding Things At Savathya Bhikkhus, those ascetics and Brahmins who regard anything as self in various ways all regard as self the five aggregates. Subject to clinging, or a certain one among them. What five? Here, Bhikkhus, the uninstructed worldling, who is not a seer of the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who is not a seer of superior persons and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regards form as self, or self as possessing form, or form as in self, or self as in form. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, volitional formations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessing. Consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. Thus this way of regarding things and the notion I am have not vanished in him. As I am has not vanished, there takes place a descent of the five faculties of the eye faculty, the ear faculty, the nose faculty, the tongue faculty, the body faculty. There is, bhikkhus, the mind, there are mental phenomena, there is the element of ignorance. When the uninstructed worldling is contacted by a feeling born of ignorance contact, I am occurs to him, I am this occurs to him, I will be and I will not be, and I will consist of form and I will be formless, and I will be percipient and I will be non-percipient and I will be neither percipient nor non-percipient these occur to him. 
The five faculties remain right there, Dhikhas, but in regard to them the instructed noble disciple abandons ignorance and arouses true knowledge. With the fading away of ignorance and the arising of true knowledge, I am does not occur to him, I am this does not occur to him, I will be and I will not be, and I will consist of form and I will be formless, and I will be percipient and I will be non-percipient and I will be neither percipient nor non-percipient these do not occur to him. When you identify anything as self, you always identify one or other of the five aggregates. SN.2248 Kandhasutta, Aggregates At Savathya Bhikkhus, I will teach you the five aggregates and the five aggregates subject to clinging. Listen to that. And what, Bhikkhus, are the five aggregates? Whatever kind of form there is, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is called the form aggregate. Whatever kind of feeling there is, this is called the feeling aggregate. Whatever kind of perception there is, this is called the perception aggregate. Whatever kind of volitional formations there are, these are called the volitional formations aggregate. Whatever kind of consciousness there is, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is called the consciousness aggregate. These, bhikkhus, are called the five aggregates. And what, bhikkhus, are the five aggregates subject to clinging? Whatever kind of form there is, whether past, future, or present, far or near, that is tainted, that can be clung to, this is called the form aggregate subject to clinging. Whatever kind of feeling there is, that is tainted, that can be clung to, this is called the feeling aggregate subject to clinging. Whatever kind of perception there is, that is tainted, that can be clung to, this is called the perception aggregate subject to clinging. Whatever kind of volitional formations there are, that are tainted, that can be clung to, these are called the volitional formations aggregate subject to clinging. Whatever kind of consciousness there is, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, that is tainted, that can be clung to, this is called the consciousness aggregate subject to clinging. These, bhikkhus, are called the five aggregates subject to clinging. The distinction between five aggregates and five grasping aggregates. SN.22.49 Sana Sutta, Sana. Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Then Sana the householder's son approached the Blessed One. The Blessed One then said to Sana the householder's son, Sana, when any ascetics and Brahmins, on the basis of form which is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change regard themselves thus, I am superior, or I am equal, or I am inferior, what is that due to apart from not seeing things as they really are? When any ascetics and Brahmins, on the basis of feeling, on the basis of perception, on the basis of volitional formations, on the basis of consciousness which is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change regard themselves thus, I am superior, or I am equal, or I am inferior, what is that due to apart from not seeing things as they really are? Sana, when any ascetics and Brahmins do not, on the basis of form which is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change regard themselves thus, I am superior, or I am equal, or I am inferior, what is that due to apart from seeing things as they really are? When any ascetics and Brahmins do not, on the basis of feeling, on the basis of perception, on the basis of volitional formations, on the basis of consciousness which is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change regard themselves thus, I am superior, or I am equal, or I am inferior, what is that due to apart from seeing things as they really are? What do you think, Sana, is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. 
is what is impermanent suffering or happiness. Suffering, venerable sir, is what is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change fit to be regarded thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir. Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Is perception permanent or impermanent? Are volitional formations permanent or impermanent? Is consciousness permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change fit to be regarded thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir. Therefore, sana, any kind of form whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all form should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of feeling whatsoever, any kind of perception whatsoever, any kind of volitional formations whatsoever, any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all. Consciousness should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Seeing thus, Sana, the instructed noble disciple experiences revulsion towards form, revulsion towards feeling, revulsion towards perception, revulsion towards volitional formations, revulsion towards consciousness. Experiencing revulsion, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion his mind is liberated. When it is liberated there comes the knowledge, it's liberated. He understands, destroyed is birth, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more for the state of being. The Buddha teaches a householder named Sana not to be conceited about the five aggregates. SN.22.50 Duddhi Yasona Sutta, Sana, 2. Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Then, Sana the householder's son approached the Blessed One. The Blessed One then said to Sana the householder's son, Sana, those ascetics or Brahmins who do not understand form, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation, who do not understand feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation, these I do not consider to be ascetics among ascetics or Brahmins among Brahmins, and these venerable ones do not, by realizing it for themselves with direct knowledge, in this very life enter and dwell in the goal of asceticism or the goal of Brahminhood. But, Sana, those ascetics and Brahmins who understand form its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation, who understand feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation, these I consider to be ascetics among ascetics and Brahmins among Brahmins, and these venerable ones, by realizing it for themselves with direct knowledge, in this very life enter and dwell in the goal of asceticism and the goal of Brahminhood. The Buddha teaches a householder named Sana that any true ascetic understands the five aggregates. SN.22.51 Nandakaya Sutta, Destruction of Delight, 1. At Savathya. Bhikkhus, a bhikkhu sees as impermanent form which is actually impermanent, that is his right view. Seeing rightly, he experiences revulsion. With the destruction of delight comes the destruction of lust, with the destruction of lust comes the destruction of delight. With the destruction of delight and lust the mind is liberated and is said to be well liberated. A bhikkhu sees as impermanent feeling which is actually impermanent, perception which is actually impermanent, volitional formations which are actually impermanent, consciousness which is actually impermanent, that is his right view. With the destruction of delight and lust the mind is liberated and is said to be well liberated.
right view is seeing the aggregates as they are impermanent, and this leads to freedom. SN.22.52 Dutti and Andakaya Sutta, Destruction of Delight, 2. At Zavathya. Bhikkhus, attend carefully to form. Recognize the impermanence of form as it really is. When a bhikkhu attends carefully to form and recognizes the impermanence of form as it really is, he experiences revulsion towards form. With the destruction of delight comes the destruction of lust, with the destruction of lust comes the destruction of delight. With the destruction of delight and lust the mind is liberated and is said to be well liberated. Bhikkhus, attend carefully to feeling, to perception, to volitional formations, to consciousness. With the destruction of delight and lust the mind is liberated and is said to be well liberated. Focusing properly on the five aggregates you see them are they are and become free. And SN060, YouTube Video Buddhist Sutras. HTTPS colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash user slash lich one.